seed that fell on different soil. Uh, just a few announcements today. It's good to have you in the house of the Lord today. Why don't you just turn? Can you turn your head? We are allowed even with masks just to say to each other, good morning, wave, please wave. We're saying good morning to those that are watching today online. We're saying good morning to them too. It's good. It's good to recognize each other and say good morning to each other. Can we wave to the other side? And wave to the other side. And hey, other side, wave to this side. Our two cohorts that are not allowed. But praise God, it's good to be in his house together this morning. And I'm just thankful. Guess what I'm thankful for today? I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for the Lord. But I'm thankful this is the last Sunday in January. <laughs> Amen? Yeah, we're over half, well, we're about halfway, right? Halfway through winter, officially. I mean, we know the island likes to shake its fist at us when it comes to winter, but... I look at the calendar and I just say to myself, it's officially over. So I'm on the countdown. I'm counting the days. Now, you guys that like winter sports, you're all saying to me, bah humbug. Because uh, you're wanting the snow and you're wanting to enjoy it. God bless you. That's all I got to say. <laughs> um, just a few things to bring to your attention. Because we're on the edge now of this month and into a new month. And the month of February, where we celebrate God's love. I love February and the emphasis on love. We who have experienced his love want others to know it as well. Next Sunday will be Communion Sunday. And so just to let you know that. Uh, we have put out in the newsletter today, that uh, this week, that if you uh, are at home, going to be watching at home, and uh, you want to partake communion with us to have the emblems ready, our stewards uh, would be willing to drop the sealed cups off to you. Mark is going to go, hmm? <laughs> but if you're at home and you would like those little sealed cups delivered, we would see that those cups are delivered to you. Mark's got thumbs up. Uh, we would like to uh, deliver the emblems to you ready for Sunday so that you can partake uh, with us. Uh, we're going to do something special. We're trying to be creative, trying to think outside the box. Today, Michelle has offered to help with some stuff, and the kids are waving at the back, and we're waving the kids back in the back corner. We've got a few things, kind of a hands-on Sunday for them a bit today. The other item we want to bring to your attention is, and we've put it in the newsletter, because of COVID, uh, we're so thankful we have Sunday school, but we're not able to offer junior church, and uh, it's been breaking our hearts because there have been young families who have said, is there junior church yet? Is there junior church yet? Just too difficult for them to sit through a whole service without some kind of program for the children. And so we want to do something special on Valentine's Day. On, on uh, the 14th, Sunday the 14th, we want to do a family service. So just so that we're giving you a heads up, and we're talking church family, we're all family. We're the family of God. But that Sunday, we're going to make it directed towards families with young children, and we're going to act out the message together, and we're just going to do things a little different that Sunday. And so what we need is for you to help get the word out and invite some of the families that haven't been out for a while, um, and we would love to be able to do that that Sunday. And who's to say in the future, uh, maybe we'll do that every once in a while, offer something for our young families. And so maybe some grandparents... Uh, want to bring some grandkids that Sunday. That's been part of our heart and what we'd like to do. Alabaster offering is the end of the month, the 28th. Uh, and praise God, Wendy, uh, she was on her way here today and the road was slippery and they turned around and went back home. But she'd like you to know that the foot care ministry has started up again. And this Saturday the 6th and she is also the 27th. This Saturday is all booked up, but if you want to call Wendy directly, uh, and that the 27th, there was still some areas that you could book. So it's good to be in the house of the Lord together today. And Pastor Mike is going to come with a call to worship. Call to worship today comes from Isaiah 55. And beginning in reading on verse 6, but going back a bit, it's an invitation for all those that love the Lord to come and those who don't to come as well. And it starts out with full, everyone who thirsts. But as we get closer to the middle of the passage, we have these words. Can you stand up for the reading of God's word? 
the honoring of God's word. And before I read, just to remind the, of those that come to Wednesday night with the sanctuary, and we're doing what the Bible says about refugees, and we look at Jesus, the refugee, how he was called out of the land of Israel to go to Egypt. This week we look at welcoming a stranger, and it's the book of Ruth. And to those that plan to be here, if you can read the book of Ruth, I put a, a little information sheet on the bulletin board that says how long it takes to read each book of the Bible. And the book of Ruth takes 14 minutes. 14 minutes, that's it. You read the whole thing, and you find out what God's plan and how God deals with strangers and what he calls us to do. But now let's hear the word of the Lord. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake the way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty. But it will accomplish that which I purpose, and it succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace, and the mountains and the hills before you shall burst into songs, and all the trees of the field will have clap their hand. Let us worship the Lord Father as we come to you this day. We thank you, Lord, for the dual aspect of retreating into you and then engaging in the world. And we know that this time of worship is a time where we retreat as a collective body into you, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, so that when we, move, we get to engage in the secular world with the glorious message of the Word of God, that we can bring salt, oh Lord, to unsavory conditions and lifestyles, oh Lord. That we can be a testimony of light where there is darkness. That we can be a testimony of mercy where there is no mercy. And forgiveness where there is no forgiveness. So, Lord, we come to worship you. And we say, word of God, speak to us. Fall fresh upon us. Challenge us. Equip us so that we may truly be the engaged community of the living God. We ask these things through Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is great to be together in the house of the Lord this morning. Fantastic looking congregation this morning. We're going to sing nice and loud and worship our Savior this morning. Um, our Sunday school lesson this morning was on love, and our, and our introduction on our video this morning was on love. Show a little love. Uh, let that be our, our love for the next step. With, with, uh, with Valentine's Day coming up, and this is the season to show love, to show God's love in the world. As you notice, that the more we give, the more we show, the more we expand, the greater it gets. God is love. Be that all my vision.
authority. There is power. See, we have no power in ourselves. You know this. You've heard it before, but today you need to be reminded. We have no power in ourselves. But when we come in his name, the name of Jesus, and his authority, he is all powerful. And so what we're inviting is his power into our prayer concern, into our need, into the need of another person we're praying for. And so therefore, what a powerful name. What a powerful name. Take whatever position you want to take for prayer this morning. Some of you might want to come to the altar. And let's just pray together in that name. Lord, we thank you today for the power that you have given us. In the name of Jesus and his authority, you told us that we could bind things on earth and they would be bound and we could loosen things in heaven and they would be loose. You told us that two or three would agree here on earth, therefore it would be so in heaven. Lord, you have given us all power and authority. I pray for forgiveness, Lord, for us as a church, that often we speak and often we go around that we're powerless. Lord, we are not today. We are not powerless because we have you, O oh God, who just moves. And not that we're here at our beck and call, but Lord, we're at your beck and call today. How would you have us pray? What would you have us pray for? Uh, Lord, we lift up those today that need encouragement. This is a time of the year when there is terrible discouragement, oh God. And then COVID is just added to it. Uh, I, uh, I pray, Lord, that you would be the lifter of their heads today. That they wouldn't look down at what they're seeing, but they would look up. I've always loved that statement that we don't look for the undertaker. We look for the undertaker of our souls. And so, God, if you look up and see you high and lifted up and exalted, we know that Isaiah, when he had that vision of you, Lord, was in a time of grief. The king had just died. He was grieving. He was blue. He was depressed. And then you gave him a wonderful vision that was enough for the rest of his life, oh God, to minister and be your prophet. God, give us those kinds of visions of seeing you high and exalted. That it's something that would be uh, just something we would never forget, oh God. It would stay with us for the rest of our lives. And Lord, we realize that vision of Isaiah that you called them then to go forth and be the spokesman. And you touched his lips. And so God, give us visions today that you would touch us again and empower us with your word. Passion in our hearts. Set on fire for you, oh God. Set a blaze for you. But it all starts with a new, fresh vision of you, high and exalted and lifted up. We realize today that we do serve a powerful God. And God, help us to believe that again. Help us to speak your power, your life, uh, your transformation in people's lives around us. Right now, Lord, people as they're praying are thinking of names, are thinking of people. That their situation looks hopeless, but not to our God who has all power. No situation, no life is, is, is hopeless, oh God. Because of you, not because of us, but because of you. And so, Lord, I pray right now for those that are going through a time of hopelessness. They don't know where to turn. God, I pray today that they would turn to you. Last night you gave us a vision in prayer of people standing outside God's love. And it was time to step into it. And Lord, I pray that people did that last night, but I even pray that again this morning, that those that did not hear that last night, that, and whoever they might be, that they hear everyone else talking about God's love, and yet they don't understand it. It seems like something foreign to them. They're on the outside, and they want to experience it. God, I pray today would be the day that they would step in, step into what God has for them, to step into that love of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Step into that love that drove him to that cross to die in their place, that uh, caused him to go down through that tomb into that place of death and to redeem it uh, for us, and then didn't just stay there, but ascended to the right hand of the Father, that now he has all authority and power. As our high priest this morning, he's praying for us, he's interceding for us, and the Father and the Son were satisfied that they even poured out the Holy Spirit upon us. God, we are so loved this morning. May we know it do in a fresh way. So much so that it bubbles up in us. And we're able to spread it and share it with other people. When they see us, they see Jesus. 
They see his eyes and love of compassion. When we touch, they sense that they felt Jesus touch them. God, when we speak, they would hear the words of Jesus. So fill us, Lord, to the uttermost today, that we might go forth in this month especially, be instruments of your love, compassion, care, kindness. God, do that transforming work that only you can do. We thank you today, Lord, for how your love has transformed us. God, we pray now for those that need a miracle, those that need a physical touch. Some need it emotionally, some need it relationally. Uh, Lord, but we are praying today also for those who need it physically. We're mindful of Kendall and Carla as they continue to fight this battle, oh God. We pray that you would restore him not to some help, but to perfect help, oh God. We pray for complete restoration. I'm reminded when the man who touched that was blind and he, and he saw only partially, and Lord, you touched him again because you weren't satisfied for him just having partial sight. God, we pray for Kendall that you would touch him and touch him and touch him again, oh God, until he is completely healed for your glory, oh God. We pray the same over Pearl and this surgery on her hip. We think of Norma today and we pray you would continue to help her and touch her, Lord, in this journey. And God, there are so many others that need a healing touch. We think of, of Eleanor's brother-in-law, Gary, in Ontario, that we were praying for last evening. And every one of us, Lord, right now probably knows someone we can mention their name to you that need a touch today. Lord, we lift them to you. We ask that you would come. Do not pass them by. Oh, wonderful, gentle Savior. Come and touch. Come and heal. Come and make whole. We pray for your glory. And God, we would give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory for what you have done, what you're about to do. God, we want to be people who are ready to give you the praise and the thanks and the glory. For you are a God who is all powerful. We give you all the praise and all the glory and all God's people said, amen. amen and amen. Amen. God bless you. Do you realize when we say truly, truly, and we're saying it in a way that we're agreeing on earth. And that's the power of corporate prayer, the power of coming together and saying amen together. At this time, Margie's going to come and read our scripture for us. I really enjoyed that little hymn pack today because it was on the sower and the portion of scripture that she had selected is on the sower. And I'm a visual learner, so therefore I really enjoyed it. I'm not going to sing it though. Uh, the reading today is from Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, verses 1 to 20. For those of you who have a Bible and would like to follow along, I'm reading from the New King James Version. And again he began to teach by the sea, and a great multitude was gathered to him. So that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole multitude was on the land, facing the sea. Then he taught them many things by parables, and then to them in his teachings. Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell to the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop and sprang up increased and produced, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But when he was alone, 
those around him with the twelve, asked him about the parable. And he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, all things come in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and he takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately they receive it with gladness. They have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a short for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises in the word world, word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word, and the cares of this world, and deceitfulness of riches, and the desires of other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But those who hear the word, accept it, and hear, and, and bear fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. May God bless the reading of his word. And so this uh, very familiar, right, 
parable, as we heard and we heard the video today, he says, listen, look, the sower went out to sow. We see that in verse 3. I like what uh, Barclay uh, said about the parable. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So a parable is a comparison. So Jesus is taking everyday life uh, situations, scenarios, and as he takes those, he's now trying to teach you a, a secret of heaven, a secret of the kingdom. And so this is what he's doing, right? It's this comparison. And that this truth may be grasped. And we can ask ourselves, why would Jesus use parables? Well, he's trying to spark interest. He's trying to get his listeners to move in closer. Trying to make sense of it. So Jesus is drawing them in. And we said, it's a mystery. It's not a puzzle to be solved. It is a mystery. And it is those that have faith in Jesus, who believe, who are his disciples, who are insiders, that these mysteries of the kingdom are for them. And so then Jesus goes and he quotes a difficult part of this passage is in verse 12. Jesus is quoting a passage from Isaiah 6, verses 9 to 10, talking about people never getting it. And some people have interpreted, well, then God doesn't want them to get the message. And that is not the truth. God wants all people to get the message. Amen. But it's the reality of people why they don't get the message. It is their own issues why they don't get the message. The message, they're blinded by prejudice, they're defeated by wishful thinking, or they're just too lazy to think for themselves. I, I said it this way, it's like when we say, it's like trying to talk to a brick wall, right? That's basically what Jesus is saying here. Though the word has been coming and coming to God's people, uh, to all people, like Isaiah was preaching, some people just don't listen to God. What's the seed? The seed is the word, right? And it's referred to as the logos. And, uh, and so as we think about the logos, actually that first uh, chapter of John made it very clear. John said it this way, in the beginning was the logos. In the beginning was the word. And the logos was with God, and the logos was God. And so Jesus is now the word. Jesus is the seed. That's trying to be planted. And so often when we think about word, we think about this word, right? And that's where we kind of can lose sight of what the emphasis of this passage is. See, this, this is the written word, and the purpose of the written word is that you might have an encounter with who? The word. The word who is the Logos. And the Holy Spirit takes this as you read it, and he wants you to have an experience with Jesus Christ. Yes, yes, it's important to know the written word. Yes, it's important to memorize it and be able to quote it. But if you haven't had an experience with the word, you've missed the point of this. Because this has been written that you might know the word, the seed of God, Jesus Christ. And so today's parable is about a familiar story, isn't it, for us in West Prince? <clears throat> the farmer went to plant seed. I think there's probably a few farmers that are already starting to plan a little. You think? Or you don't even want to think about it? No comments. They're all being very quiet. I can see their eyes kind of do something there behind the masks. <clears throat> so, so there's this reality of the spring. We see it here, don't we? They're going out to plant the seed. And we're told that the seed is... Praise God for good seed. <laughs> you don't want to be putting bad seed out in the field. You want good seed. Because you want the ultimate yield, right? You want the best yield that you can have. So we're told that the seed is good. What this parable about is not about the seed. What's it about? Where it lands. It's about the condition of the soil. It's about where it's planted and how the soil receives it. And so that's really what this parable is about. And so the first thing that we see is that there's the condition of the path. The hardened path. So the way they would sow seed in those days is they had a bag and they would spread it. They would walk the field and spread it. And it would be right after it had been plowed. So right after it had been plowed, the soil was open and ready to receive the seed. And then they would turn it over after. But the problem was the 
there were uh, footpaths between the fields. And those footpaths were so when the crops started to come up, they could walk through and access the different fields. And those footpaths had become very, very hard. And the reality is that as they were walking and throwing the seed, some of it would get on the footpath. But guess who was waiting? <laughs> the birds were watching. And the birds would come and swoop down and eat up all that seed that was on the footpaths, the hardened soil. Jesus explains to his disciples, the insider, in verse 15, what he's talking about. He, he said, these are ones who have heard the word, but have hardened hearts. They're, they're against the message. Therefore, the gospel has never been able to take root. And the evil one comes in and swoops down and snatches it before the good news can penetrate anywhere. There's no impact on that heart. And we need to realize today that there are some people whose hearts are so hardened that they will not receive the Christian truth. It can't seem to find an entry into their hearts. That's why we pray, the power of prayer, when we say, God, would you soften, what do we pray? God, would you soften their hearts? We're asking that the Holy Spirit would begin to do a work in their lives, that their hearts would begin to be softened, that they could receive the word. And so, unfortunately, the gospel is not able to take root. I like what somebody said. They explained it this way. There are some people whose hearts are so hard that the Christian truth can't find entry. Christianity fails to make an impact, not because they are hostile, but because they're indifferent. So true. They couldn't care less. It's irrelevant to them. They don't want Jesus, they don't want the faith, and they don't care. That's basically what we're saying about the soil that received the seed that is hardened like a footpath. It is so hard the seed cannot penetrate. Then we know there's the seed that fell on rocky places. Now, many of you know I'm a Newfoundlander. Anyone may be new listening in today? And the Newfoundland is called what? The rock. rock. Guess what? There's a lot of rock in Newfoundland. And the one thing you don't see too much is gardens. I don't think I've ever seen a garden, a vegetable garden, growing up as a child in Newfoundland. Now, the one thing I did see, traveling up to St. Anthony's, is that the Newfoundlanders had their vegetable gardens on the side of the highway. I guess they found that was the best soil. It was probably trucked in to do, probably trucked in to do the highway. And so we'd be driving all the way up the same empty ditch, and over there is another, and they're growing potatoes and a few other things there. Because the truth of it is, where there's rock, you're not going to get very far with a garden. And so this is telling us that over in Palestine, it was very similar. They had limestone, and in some areas, you wouldn't be able to tell, but it was just a very thin covering of soil yes. over the limestone. And so you would plow it, and then you would sow the seed, and it looked great. Actually, it would germinate even quicker than the other seeds. And it would pop up, and the farmer would get all excited. But that hot Palestinian sun would begin to heat up that limestone that was underneath. And as it heated up the limestone, there was no moisture for those seeds. They had no deep roots. And so that seed would shrivel up and die. Jesus explains in verse 16, he reminds the listener about the shallow hearts. We use the word superficial. <laughs> what does superficial mean? No depth, you can scratch the surface. These were the people who had received the word and uh, begin to allow the word to sprout up in their lives, but they're not willing to do the work that is needed to go down deep into their faith. And the word has not yet penetrated to produce the change and regeneration that God wants in their lives. They started off well. See, I always say it's not how you start. It's how you finish. finish. That matters. And they started off well. But then all of a sudden the heat of trials and tribulations and the cost of following Jesus kicked in. And they just shriveled up because of that. I like what Barclay said. Barclay says it takes about 5% effort to win a man to Christ, or win a woman to Christ. But it takes 95% effort to keep them in Christ and growing and maturing.
That is the key, my friends. See, when the going got tough, they just didn't show up. <laughs> They left. They were gone. We see that. We talked about that, that Jesus had that happen to him. When he started uh, being persecuted, when Jesus started teaching, difficult teaching, there was a lot of people that just thought, I've had enough of this, and they left him. See, for us, we have to realize there's a lot of people attracted initially to the gospel message, but they've never allowed it to go beyond just surface for them. To be an insider... For Jesus, it's all or nothing. Always has been. It's not a little bit of Jesus and everything else. For Jesus, it is all or nothing. He demands total commitment from us. Then there's the seed that is sown among thorns. And so thorn bushes were, you know, we've got, <laughs> we've got the red dogwood down in Shelton that we've been trying to get rid of. And of course, the only way you can get rid of it is you dig it out deep, right? Which we haven't done. And Pastor Mike's been working hard, and he goes out with his old lawnmower that keeps going, keeps on ticking, and he drives over that stuff and keeps it down low. So you wouldn't know <coughs> it's there. But the moment you stop cutting it, guess what? It pops up. Same thing with these thorns. They would burn fields to get rid of it. They would, they would uh, cut it down low. But the problem was that once you planted it and you put the seed in it, then the plants would begin to come up. And guess what came up with them? The thorns came up. And the thorns would overpower the plants. And so they looked great for a while. But Jesus emphasizes something here. The thorns came up and they didn't produce any fruit. What's the point of seed? To make fruit. To become fruitful. To multiply. And so the seed wasn't able to multiply because the thorns came up and choked the very life out of them. Jesus explains what this is all about in verse 18. He says, this is the person who received the gospel but has, uh, has competition for worldly desire. This is the person who wants Jesus and the things of the world. Uh, it's not enough to potentially produce the life of the seed, and it begins to develop. But for them, the message of the gospel is great, but then all of a sudden, cares and worries come their way, and they just kind of get distracted, and they get pulled away with competing priorities. See, this person has not yet placed the kingdom of God first and above everything else in their lives. And I want to tell you, my friends, I think this is an area that can really affect the church of today if we're not careful. That bit by bit, the kingdom of God gets choked out. We've seen it time and time in the church. We've seen it time and time again in people's lives who are very committed and godly people that all of a sudden the cares of this world or things get happening, get involved, and before you know it, it just chokes the very life out of them. See, it's so easy to pack our lives with so much. You know, the actual word here that is used in the Greek, the phrase that's used here is actually deceptive pleasure. Deceptive pleasure. How deceptive pleasure can get hold of us and take over. Now here, I'm going to tell you something, and I've been challenged with it. I'm 59. This will be my 60th year, God willing, if I get that far in October. And there is a malaise that is hitting the 50s and 60-year-olds that we feel that we've worked hard all our lives and we've been busy in the church and we've done all these things. And if we're not careful, a little slumber, a little peace, sit back and relax. They're finding in North America that that's a challenge in the church, that that's the very thing that can come and hit us at this generation if we're not careful, is our lives can get so filled with so many things and so busy and there's some of them that are in the sandwich generation where you're trying to deal with grandkids and you're trying to deal with elderly parents that in the midst of it, you're like, well, where's the time for the things of God? You'll understand. And before you know it, the very life-giving force, that seed of God is being choked out of your life. And there's no fruit. This is what Jesus is telling us to be careful, to keep our priorities straight, to stay alert, to pay attention. Yes, God wants to bless us. God wants us to experience great and good things. But we need to make sure that we are keeping his kingdom first. Got quiet all of a sudden. 
seed that fell on good soil. Praise the Lord, we got there. And the seed germinates and matures. Jesus doesn't say a whole lot here, does he? He says, and the seed germinates and matures. The roots go down deep, and they multiply 30 times and 60 times and 100 times. See, there's three things here. Very quickly, you see it matures. So there's aspect that the seed is there to mature and to grow. It gets its roots. As the seed matures, it gets its roots down deep into the things of God. And then that automatically, if you, like this is what it's saying, if you get your roots down deep, if you're maturing in your faith, you will multiply. It says it right here. It just happens. It happens naturally. Jesus is saying, if you plant seed on good soil, right, and it begins to mature and it's healthy, and it gets its roots down deep, you are sure of what? A harvest. And that's what Jesus is saying here, that if we allow the word of God, Christ himself, to come into our lives, and we're willing to mature in our faith, and we're willing to get our roots down deep, we are guaranteed that there will be a harvest, that our faith will multiply. I thought that would be an amen there, but anyway. So what makes the fourth soil so good? Very simple. It hears, really listens, takes the heart, because it understands, right? And allows the kingdom to take full root in their heart. See, the condition of one's heart is like good soil, and it will produce fruit of a kingdom life. That's why the word tells us to guard our hearts. Guard our hearts. Make sure you keep your hearts clean. Make sure you keep your hearts pure. That's why we talk about it's so important to forgive when you need to forgive. And to forget when you need to forget. And just to keep our hearts pure before the Lord. If we sin, if we sin, it doesn't become a norm for our life. But if we sin, praise God, we have an advocate. And we confess and we repent to keep this pure and clean. So my heart is the proper condition to receive the word, to receive in the word, and that I will have my faith continue to mature. You know what that says to me? I might think I'm mature yesterday, but I'm not mature enough. He said, he says, I can still be a better Christian tomorrow. Amen. Right? And no matter how deep I have my roots, my roots can still go down deeper Amen. into the things of God. And, and that's why it's so important for us to realize that God wants to do that work in us. Now, what do we need to learn from this? All the preaching and the sharing that you do, there will be different responses. That's what this passage tells us. See, we, we think that everyone should just like that get the message, right? And, and, and the truth of it is Jesus is telling us here, not so. Not so, that there are, it has everything to do with the condition of people's hearts. You can have the good seed, Christ, and you can sow. Nothing wrong with you as a sower. It has to do with the condition of hearts. And so we have to realize that there are some who will hear it and forget. They don't care. There are those who are enthusiastic and we get excited, but it's short term. It's not lived out. Some have too much else in their minds and they were very much excited and part of it, but now they're gone to deal with their cares and their worries. And praise God, though, there are some who are fruitful and some who receive the word and are fruitful indeed. Praise God, the power is in the seed. Not in us, the sowers. It is in the seed. We have our responsibility to make sure our hearts are good soil, but God has called us also what? To sow. Now there's a good picture for you, how they used to do potato farming. I like that one. We're all called to sow. If we are in Christ, if we're insiders, if we are disciples of Christ, we're all called to sow. All of us, every one of us. We continue to share our faith. We continue to share the seed, Jesus Christ, with other people. We need to have patience. Just like I believe some of your greatest people of faith and patience are our farmers. Because they, in faith, sow the seed and then they have to wait. 
And it's the same thing for us, that we need to sow the gospel and the good news and continue to share it, knowing that we will receive different responses. But one thing is sure, the harvest, my friend, is sure. God's word promises that to us. See, I believe sometimes we can get discouraged. I think Jesus here, his disciples were starting to get discouraged. They, they had seen what happened in Jerusalem, and they were trying to kill him, and they had to leave. Remember last week, the scribes came down and called him, what, the devil. And, and they're seeing these reverse, all kinds of responses, and they're getting discouraged. And so Jesus is telling them in this parable to encourage them to say there's going to be different responses. Don't worry about that. I am the seed, the Father is the sower, now you're called to go and sow as well. The growth is the Lord's, it's not yours, it's not your responsibility. What you are called to do is sow, and leave it with God. You have no power over anything else, but you must continue to sow, don't get discouraged. And if we sow, the harvest is sure, 30 times, 60 times. A hundred times. So you sow and you leave the growing with God. I love this picture. It spoke to me this week. Think you can't make a difference? Look what a mere seed could do. One seed is what caused that breaking of that rock. No matter how hard it was. That gives me hope for hardened hearts. Someone said it this way, it may seem that much of our effort achieves no result. It may seem that much of our labor is wasted. In many places, it seems like his message has failed. They were discouraged. We can be discouraged. But this parable said to them, and it says to us today, be patient, my friends. Do your work unto the Lord. Sow the seed and leave the rest to God. The harvest is sure. I like what somebody said. The ministry of the gospel is worthwhile. Now, I'm saying that after 30-something years of ministry. The ministry of the gospel is worthwhile, intrinsically valuable, independently fruitful, and totally unpredictable. So why should we think first about these three seeds? It's important for us to see why they failed. There isn't anything wrong with the seed. We've said that. There isn't anything wrong with the sower. It has to do with the condition of the heart. Check our hearts today. We need to not be unreceptive to what God is wanting to teach us and show us, even in the midst of a pandemic. Are you open to what God wants to teach you? Others are superficial. Some are too preoccupied. And even those who are receptive can see different effects, whether it be 30 times, 60 times, or 100 times. So I have to ask you the question today, what's the condition of your heart? When you look at these four seeds, I pray you can say, Lord, it is good soil. We have to ask that. I remember when we went to Bible school in European Nazarene Bible College uh, in Guzzi in Germany, and we started off in Theology 101. And I guess there was about 20 of us in that class. Classroom was full. We were all excited. We were just called into ministry. And everybody was sharing what God had put on our hearts. Lots of excitement. And, and so we, when I think about that today, when we came to graduation to finish the education, there was a handful of us. Right? And sadly to say today, even out of that handful, there's only a few still in ministry today. That is the reality if we're not careful. That is why I've always loved this statement from Eugene Peterson, and he has a book under this title, I believe. It's about a long obedience, you've heard me say it before, in the same direction. That's what it's about, my friends. A long obedience, patiently, sowing, patiently checking our hearts and making sure it is good soil and we're pure before the Lord, and just doing, keeping on, keeping on. Uh, Pastor Mike and I have prayed for the Lord to help us during COVID to be an unanxious presence. To not be flighty, to not be one week over here and next week over there, but by God's grace to be an unanxious presence in the midst of a storm. And I believe by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do that. Because really, it's about a long obedience in the same 
direction. This also tells us that it's about, as we said, we're all called to sow. How have you been doing with sowing? Getting discouraged? Getting discouraged that you're not seeing the results that you would like to see? But I'm so thankful today that Jesus tells us through this parable that the harvest is sure. That that harvest is coming and has come. And we know in other places he says, Lord, the cry unto the Lord of the harvest, right? That the laborers are few, that he would send the workers where? Into the harvest, to bring the harvest in. Every day, God is bringing forth a harvest if we have the eyes to see it. You know, do you ever realize that Jesus was a mathematician? Because here he gives us the math. You think about it for a moment, right? Say you have a thousand seeds, and you take that thousand seeds and you sow it. Now, we can get discouraged because three quarters of the what? It's lost. But a quarter of it fell on good soil. That's what he wants us to look at. A quarter of it fell on good soil. And that quarter that fell on good soil, 250 seeds, times it by 100, is what? 25,000. See, there's a multiplication that happens in the kingdom of God that if we do what we're called to do and we just sow and leave the rest to God, God continues to further his kingdom and multiply it and touch hearts and touch lives that go out and touch other hearts and lives. And the kingdom is moving forward, whether we have the eyes to see it or not. Jonathan Chapman one of the men we might like to think of and thank for spreading is the apple tree in America is Jonathan Chapman. You know him as Johnny Appleseed. It's so quite interesting because you'll see a lot of historical pictures of him and he's always got the Bible in one hand and the sack of seeds in the other. I just thought, isn't that interesting? And he was not a legend. Some people think he was a legend. He was actually a real man who was born in Massachusetts back in 1774, and he settled alone into the unexplored wilderness that is now Ohio, Indiana, and western Pennsylvania. And he had a sack of apple seeds. And you know where he got these apple seeds? He got them out of the garbage. There were cider mills in Massachusetts, and they would take the seeds and throw them out as garbage, and he would go there and collect those seeds and put them in his sack, and then he would begin to travel. And he began to travel out in the wilderness, and as he traveled out in the wilderness, he just planted seeds and planted more seeds and continued to do this throughout his lifetime. He would actually go and retrace his steps and even prune the apple trees when he find them, the ones that he had planted. He keeps pruning them. And it's just so amazing that although he died, when he died in 1846, he covered more than 100,000 square miles with apple trees. That's quite something. One person taking one life to sow, and what do you? I thought if that's so true for Johnny Appleseed, how much more true for us who sow the gospel of Christ? There will be a wonderful yield, my friends. One day when we enter into his kingdom, we'll hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And I believe that old song, Ray Bolt's song that we used to sing, we used to have a pantomime group that would act it out, that says, thank you for giving to the Lord. That story of people coming up and saying, you don't know, but the one you shared your faith to, who shared their faith, shared it with me. And I'm here today because you've been faithful. That's what the kingdom is about. That's what Jesus is wanting us to get, this mystery today of the kingdom. I'm going to ask the worship team to come, and I'll close with this statement. I love this statement. Don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds you plant. That's an interesting statement. Don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds you plant. Lord, would you help us today to have the tenacity like Johnny Appleseed <laughs> with the gospel of Christ 
to go and make a difference in the world we are around and sow seed and just sow it and leave it with you, Lord. The rest is yours. The growth is yours. Uh, but Lord, we do pray today that anyone that's listening today in the sound of my voice and even how I've had to check my own heart and life, I pray that we would be good soil, that we would not have hardened hearts, that the enemy would come and snatch the gospel, the word, that we would not be rocky, on rocky soil, where just trouble comes and we just dry up, Lord, because of it and walk away. Oh, God, we just pray <clears throat> that we would not be so concerned about the cares and the worries of this world, that we would just be uh, sidetracked like the thorns, God, and that, that, that any kind of trouble and difficulty, we just, God, we're just not bearing fruit because we're so distracted, sometimes distracted by good things. God, I pray today that our hearts would be ready soil to bring and receive, first of all, to receive the word, and then to bring forth the word, and to see a mighty harvest for your name's sake, we pray. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Won't you stand with us?
and say to him, you know, I, I really want to be passionate about God. I, I really want to know more about Jesus. And so this uh, father, spiritual father, took him out to the water, to the waterfront, and they got into the deeper and deeper water, and he plunged him down in the water and held him there. And held him there. And held him there. And the young man got out choking and sputtering and couldn't understand what was going on. And the church father said to him, when you want God, like you want air, that's when you will grow in your faith. I always think of that story when we sing this song. <laughs> you are the air that I breathe. Your very words spoken to me. Maybe there's some today who would say, Pastor, I want my heart to be good soil. Would you raise a hand today? You're not raising it to me. You're raising it to him. See that hand? Anyone else? See those hands? See those hands? Some of you would say, Pastor, I'm discouraged. <laughs> I've been sowing and I've been praying and I've been struggling. And I'm thinking now particularly our families, right? But it could be anyone that you're trying to witness. Would you say that you've been discouraged in sowing the seed? Lord, you see these people today. This parable has been for them. You want their hearts to be good soil. You want to plant the word. And you want them to realize today that they're called to sow, not to get discouraged, and to leave the rest with God. And the harvest is sure. We thank the Lord for that promise today. Amen and hallelujah. Let us receive this benediction. Let us not become weary in doing good. For in the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Praise God. Receive that benediction as you go. God bless you.